Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second panel of academic event of Belgrade Security Forum. My name is Sonia Stojanovic-Gajic. I'm a co-convener of the academic event with Professor Dusan Pavlovic. And it's my pleasure to host you at a debate uh, about the uh, state capture as unintended consequence of conflict resolution. I hope you had a chance to grab a coffee, stretch your legs, and that you're ready for the discussion. An amazing panel of uh, speakers who will present their research. I'll uh, briefly remind you of house rules before, before I introduce speakers. Um, if you're following online, uh, please uh, use the question box. Uh, ask your question and say who you are asking it to. And if you're following uh, via YouTube, uh, you can put questions on Twitter using the hashtag BelsecForum10. As for my speakers, uh, they are tuning in today uh, from Pristina, uh, Sarajevo, and Atlanta, Georgia, US. So with us, they are Doni Kemini from Pristina, uh, Damir Kapudic from Sarajevo, and Christopher Jackson from uh, the US. They'll be presenting their research, and I'll start with their presentation first. So Donika is uh, a power lady who is doing part-time PhD at the Westminster University of, um, in UK, while at the same time leading a Civicos, a platform of 260 civil society organizations in Kosovo uh, in a dialogue with the government. She has a rich experience in a think tank community, uh, used to work for Kosovo Center for Security Studies in Pristina, uh, was a research fellow at, at the EU Institute of Security Studies, um, and has been engaged in a number of track two dialogues on um, uh, current issues for the Balkans, and it's still active as a member of uh, Balkans in Europe Policy Group, BPEG, uh, commenting on current EU affairs. Uh, she'll be presenting a paper on promoting stability and facilitating state capture that she co-authored with her PhD supervisor, Aidan Hayer, in a few minutes. From uh, Georgia, uh, Christopher Jackson uh, will speak on local regime chain, uh, capture in the Western Balkans. He's a PhD candidate in Georgia State University. Um, his research focuses on post-conflict institution uh, building, especially policing, international peace negotiations uh, with the geographical focus uh, to North Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, Serbia, and Cyprus. And although he is tuning in uh, from a super early morning in US, uh, he's not writing his research uh, just from armchair. He did field research in the regions that he's covering uh, uh, today and has already published some of the findings in the Journal of European Integration uh, and Ethnopolitics. And last but not the least, Damir Kapicic, our friend and colleague from uh, University of Sarajev, assistant professor uh, there, another comparative political scientist at this panel, um, and convener of many similar academic debates uh, on political uh, affairs in the Balkans, uh, we'll be presenting also research on how subnational dynamics influence state uh, capture. Uh, Damir's uh, research is on ethnic conflict, uh, political parties, power sharing, and a rare thing for him uh, is that he's not just writing about our home region Balkans, but he has actually write, uh, wrote and published comparative research on uh, Uganda and some of the Asian countries besides the region. Um, most relevant for today's discussion is probably that he edited the special issue of Southeast European and Black Sea Studies on the rise of illiberal uh, politics in Southeast Europe, which I highly recommend uh, as a follow-up reading to today's discussion. And uh, my partner uh, today and designated survivor, if anything happens to me while we are online, is Marko Zilovic who will act as a discussant uh, and comment on the three papers that are going to be presented in a minute. Uh, Marco is also a PhD candidate at the um, George Washington University in uh, DC. He is also a comparativist uh, in political science, and his PhD is on right-wing politics and why some par right-wing parties in Central Europe have uh, decided to support democracies and others undermine. So more than qualified to comment uh, today's uh, research. 
Without further uh, ado, I would call Donika to start a discussion and present uh, her research on um, dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina and the role of external actors such as EU and how that may have facilitated state capture. It's amazing to be part of this uh, panel discussion, although online, good to be part of community either way. Uh, so uh, state capture has been a, uh, a phenomenon that, um, a trend ongoing in the Western Balkans, but it was exactly with the think tank uh, pressure, academia and civil society from the Western Balkans that pushed the EU towards recognizing it officially. Uh, the, uh, the major turning point took a place in 2018 with the enlargement uh, uh, strategy towards Western Balkans, in which the EU recognized the elements of state capture existing in the Western Balkans, but not necessarily deconstructing these elements or even talking about the stakeholders uh, without realizing that the EU somehow became part of the state capture process in the Western Balkans, given the fact that all six Western Balkan countries have been part of the EU enlargement process in the past uh, 15 years or more and, and uh, have been shaped in a way to fit into the union. So what me and my uh, professor, PhD mentor, uh, Professor Heher, talked about in the paper is that how the EU unintentionally became part of the state capture uh, uh, trends in, in Kosovo and Serbia through the EU-facilitated dialogue between uh, Kosovo and, and, and Serbia. Uh, so um, the term state capture is not new, but in, in Western Balkans it means more. It means uh, uh, more because it has it entails uh, externally and internally driven actors, uh, and, and uh, the EU being uh, part of it, uh, of course. But on the other hand, it's not the state capture that we know of the the notion of the World Bank, but it's rather something that is more wider, and it it. it uh, it, it entails a, a wider process in which the leaders or uh, ruling political uh, elites actually absorb all the institutions uh, without leaving space for the opposition to exist, for the freedom of media or freedom of expression. Uh, so uh, the EU in 2011 engaged in the uh, in the dialogue between Kosovo and, and, and Serbia. And if you see the, tr the trends of democratization of both countries since then, then you will see a, a serious downfall. And this is uh, not just a finding in, in, in our paper, but this is the, the, the trend that uh, the Freedom House report uh, and uh, VDEM have been recognizing, especially in the case of, of uh, Serbia. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to the dialogue since 2011, when it, it, it was launched, it was basically a strategy of the EU to cross path the trajectories of a good neighborly relations and, and uh, the reforms. Uh, it, back then it was believed that it will be, the, the EU integration will push the countries towards uh, recognizing each other, uh, uh, normalizing their relations, and then of course the end goal would be for both EU integration process. Initially it was a good mechanism, but then somehow on the way it got misused by the political elites by somehow also including the EU uh, as an actor and, and and including in this vicious cycle uh, which led to, uh, to, uh, to state capture. If you look at the case of Serbia, for instance, uh, the chapter 35, when it was introduced back in the days, it was believed that, at least in, the, in, in Kosovo, because being from Kosovo, we actually believe that chapter 35 would definitely uh, bring something uh, in relation to, uh, to normalization with Kosovo. Uh, somehow, uh, on the way, it overshadowed the importance of for instance, 23 and 24, and Sonia, you have uh, yourself uh, advocated for this on how the EU basically uh, in, 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 in a trading of uh, normalization and results in the chapter 35, it actually undermined the importance of other chapters and 23 and 24 being the most uh, important ones. Uh, in the case of Kosovo, it is more, it is even more complex, for instance, because the EU presence in Kosovo is even more uh, emphasized than it is in, in Serbia. Uh, uh, it, it goes in three main pillars, the first one being uh, uh, 
the CSDP mission, the EU Lex mission in Kosovo, being one of the most, uh, the biggest, the biggest CSDP mission with executive powers, which then uh, in a, in another uh, made uh, EU part of the state capture process in a whole different level in comparison to to Serbia, for instance. The second track is of course the EU enlargement process through SAA and and, and uh, visa liberalization process at some point, and then of course is the dialogue between uh, Kosovo and Serbia. So what happened in, 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 in the middle of the process is that the elites in both states understanding this uh, this uh, major um, uh, importance that the EU gives to stability uh, and, and this dedication to deliver on the, the, the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia, both elites in country in, in, in both states employed a range of tactics that compelled the EU to abandon its more transformative goals in favor of narrow focus uh, uh, ma maintaining uh, stability. So the dialogue gradually from normalization turned into uh, conflict prevention. And today we have the EU that is willing to negotiate even with parties that have been deriving from elections without the participation of the opposition, which is the key element of democracy. And on the other hand, in the case of Kosovo, dialogue is being held with uh, with the government that took over the mandate um, in, in, in a very undemocratic way, uh, without detaching from this uh, state capture trends, the EU will be unable to have uh, to have a legitimate process that will bring tangible results. Just now, as we speak, the dialogue just after being restored, two years after being back and forth between the White House and Brussels, the EU is facing one of the major crises, which is the, the establishment of the Association of Serbian Municip Majority Municipalities in Kosovo, which has been an issue that is uh, that is uh, sort of posing challenges since uh, the Brussels Agreement in 2013 and then in 2015, and it has been on hold since then. So basically, uh, the, the, the EU, by combining these two approaches in the beginning, it was seen as an effective way of pushing reforms, but also pushing for normalization between Kosovo and Serbia, which didn't prove to be the case. And, and now we are facing major backsliding of democracy or state capture because we were never democracy to be uh, actually considered uh, uh, that we are backsliding from a, a point in which we were actually uh, good or, or solid. And, and of course, the, the process of dialogue is kind of uh, always a hostage of, of the political elites that have captured the state without leaving uh, alternatives uh, uh, for uh, uh, for replacement, for instance, in which it, in Serbia it is uh, today, it is almost impossible to think that there will be another person who is willing to deliver on the case of Kosovo. On the other hand, uh, in Kosovo, a reformist, a reformist uh, government has been uh, brought down to basically pave the way for another government and another leader that is willing to cooperate and deliver in the process of dialogue. So once again, uh, the international community, including here the EU, in search for um, uh, um, uh, uh, parties to for dialogue, uh, for leaders for dialogue, has undermined the importance of reforms in the region. Nika, uh, for this provocative introduction, um, in your paper you even say that domestic leaders act as pyromen that put fire and then offer the services of firefighters uh, to EU in order to keep this uh, conflict uh, prevention agenda uh, ongoing. We'll uh, continue debating uh, developments in Kosovo. Uh, but also in uh, uh, South Serbia, North Macedonia, and I will call uh, Chris uh, to present his research on how integrating uh, uh, enclaves, uh, territorially di distinct enclaves with minority populations uh, into national institutions such as policing has affected uh, the local political dynamics in these uh, three communities. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you, Sonia. Yes, and thank you for the nice introduction. 
Um, so this research addresses the general problem of uh, integrating ethnically distinct enclaves into uh, centralized police or security institutions after conflict and how that affects subsequent patterns of violence that develop after uh, formal settlements. So from both human rights and state building perspectives, the persistence of these, these distinct enclaves beyond institutionalized policing challenges both the concepts of people protection for citizens and the state's monopoly on force contributing to uh, longer term stability or instability rather. Uh, before getting into the analysis though, just want to clarify two terms. I know in Serbia or in Kosovo especially, um, enclaves can refer to specific locations, um, but I refer to them as these spaces in which ethnicity and territory are mobilized in tandem to define political control in response to, to larger movements. And then policing uh, in a broad sense, the enforcement of rules or contracts. So the general theory being uh, after conflict, a market for policing the need to enforce rules and contracts develops in these distinct enclaves, which can be met by um, a combination of three actors. One, of course, the state police uh, who operate in centralized chains of command, but have often taken part in conflict, um, have stigmas as you know, violent actors, repressors or combatants. Then there are foreign peacekeepers uh, whose missions often include police components. And lastly are the local level elites within the enclaves who emerge during conflict, uh, have established relationships and institutions with the enclave publics, but who are often illicit actors um, connected to patrimonial or violent networks. Um, so the general argument here is that where institutional arrangements after conflicts give these local elites a stake in policing, they have incentives to minimize the levels of violence in their enclaves. Uh, but where they either have total control or are completely marginalized by the state, they have incentives to use violence as a means of uh, political competition, outbidding, or weakening the state's control. So in theory, this, this makes sense, but in practice, what does it look like? Uh, so for in Kosovo, for example, um, these, this enclave process for the remaining Serbs in Kosovo was, was driven after the Komanovo Agreement, uh, where they're driven into these defensible enclaves protected by co-ethnic militias, uh, the Serbian state police operating clandestinely, um, and eventually the peacekeeping force, uh, who violently sort of opposed this external policing. Um, for all its critiques, the Brussels Agreement did incorporate these actors eventually in 2013 into centralized chains of command. Yes, it was incorporating illicit actors with the means of violence who used violence against the state, but it was also subjecting them to centralized oversight, which was something that hadn't existed before. So after 2013, efforts to police the uh, northern enclaves especially did not spark the same major violent reactions that had occurred prior to 2013, but rather these institutionalized forms of protests such as boycotts or resignations or demonstrations that have been seen in the past couple of years. In uh, southern Serbia, Chinya district, um, the recruitment of the multi-ethnic police, the civilian police after the Kanchuli agreement uh, was successful but failed to give the Albanian elites there the same same stake in policing and security. Um, primarily, you know, the, the former insurgent commanders protested limited recruitment of fighters, um, but also the presence of the, the gendarmerie, the national police uh, militarized unit, uh, outnumbered the civilian police and conducted basic policing well beyond its remit. Uh, they were not locally accountable. And as a consequence, uh, the patterns of violence in Southern Serbia did not really change for about 12, 13 years after Kanchuli agreement. Uh, there continued to be regular attacks on the gendarmerie and the civilian police, organized violence, mortar attacks, rocket attacks, bombings, uh, often in response to increased deployment or policing operations. Macedonia took a slightly different path. Um, again, multi-ethnic civilian police recruited after the OFA, um, but the local elites were given a much greater stake, uh, much more discretion in policing. The presence of peacekeepers, unlike in Serbia, had demobilized the paramilitary police, especially the lion's units, um, and prevented extremist violence within the villages. 
So after uh, 2002, really the pattern of violence in the Albanian dominated enclaves in Macedonia uh, shifted from outgroup violence uh, targeting the state police to a form of intra-group political competition in which the police were used as a tool of competition uh, and patronage, uh, especially around the election of 2008, the police-related violence. Uh, but external policing operations did not spark violence, but rather, uh, like in Kosovo after 2013, political remonstrations. So in comparing these cases, um, findings indicate that institutional arrangements after conflict in which the local elites networks, their existing violent actors, um, most often the capable violent actors, are integrated into policing, they have a stake in stability and thus an incentive to not use outgroup violence as political strategy. While this raises certain ethical and moral problems, incorporating illicit actors into the state, actors who've done violence against the state, it also subjecting them to bureaucratic oversight, uh, as is evident in Kosovo with the number of KP North officers who've been investigated or arrested in recent years. More generally, what this indicates is that in the presence of weak um, state society institutions or state enclave institutions, after conflict, local level capture by these networks can serve as a way to bind ethnic enclaves to you know, the state hierarchy, to a singular organization, while disincentivizing outgroup violence and uh, weakening the autonomy of these extra legal groups. Thank you. Chris, uh, for this uh, quite illustrative um, study of three similar but different cases, I'm sure Marco will have comments uh, on, uh, on your analysis. I'll ask immediately Damir uh, to join in and present his research on how power sharing mechanisms in multinational states uh, at the lower level of the organization of state uh, in the case of Bosnia and Malaysia uh, may lead to authoritarian uh, political tendencies. Damir, uh, it's your five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Sonia. So when we basically talk a lot about state capture, what we mostly focus on is this national level. And we say that the capture of national institutions constitutes state capture as such. And what is usually neglected in this type of reasoning is that in countries which have some form of subnational autonomy or federalism, state capture can also happen at lower levels. Um, basically, the aim of the research that I uh, look at is to, first of all, uh, compare cases where subnational institutions, and especially in multi-ethnic countries, have been able to gain a sort of uh, uh, autonomy that they have captured certain state institutions uh, and also engage in authoritarian politics. And identifying these actors and factors that impact state capture, as well as the interplay between the national level uh, and the local or regional level, is something that I want to look at in a bit more detail. Now, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, this builds on research, on well, on two strands of research, actually. Uh, it's sort of generally informed by what Guillermo Donald called brown areas. So certain areas of countries that have not been able to democratize either as fast or as thoroughly as other areas of the country have. Uh, but it has been a bit more uh, conceptualized in a bit more detail by um, Gibson on the terms of so-called boundary control. What we mean by boundary control is that subnational authorities use these subnational boundaries to sort of delimit their area of control, where the central government does not have much to say and where they can basically do what they want, also engaging in certain authoritarian practices. Um, when we mean by authoritarian practices, because this whole research is very uh, practice oriented, so we're not sort of looking at regime change, because this is also very difficult to identify at the subnational level. The regime is essentially the same, but the practices that are used to capture these institutions, they differ. And this is where we use this term of illiberal politics. Um, and illiberal politics in this sense uh, aims to study instances of subnational governance 
uh, where policies either enacted or proposed by these local or regional governing parties uh, creates an uneven electoral playing field at this regional level. Um, and basically with the aim of them to remain in power indefinitely in this, uh, in this sense. Now, the two cases that I look at here are on the one hand, Malaysia, on the one hand, on the other hand, Bosnia. They're similar, but they're also different. They have uh, levels of sub-state autonomy and federalism, but at the same time, they have uh, different um, interactions between central or national authority and the sub-national level. Um, I will skip all of this sort of uh, research design part of it and just go through a few findings. So in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a lot of these findings are related to control of, on the one hand, uh, media, so media dissemination and information control, but also control of um, challengers within the own sort of subnational uh, entity. And when I'm talking about entity, I'm mostly focusing on Republika Srpska here as this sort of subnational uh, illiberal part of the country. In this case, you have control of your sort of own ethnic contenders. So any sort of protest that is uh, driven by uh, Serbs in Republika Srpska usually faces, faces a backlash uh, from the regional government of Republika Srpska. And this creates sort of an ethnic party dominance where the only real voice is the one of the governing party. This goes through restricting freedoms of assembly, uh, restricting freedoms of uh, organization of certain protests, but also undermining access to justice in these cases where you have sort of unaccountable uh, police brutality and so on. Um, Political control of media is also very much present in this entity. So through appointment of members of boards uh, of, the national, of the public broadcaster, you can find that information is pretty much controlled in line with what the party actually wants. And the last sort of thing is that uh, patronage is heavily used in elections uh, where you have uh, state-owned state -owned enterprises and um, distribution of political offices much in line with electoral expectations. So these are sort of practices that are being used in Bosnia to create and consolidate a liberal politics at this local level. Um, in Malaysia, it works slightly differently, uh, but you can also see a few of these same factors. Uh, limiting opposition in terms of disuniting your own uh, adversaries at this local level, not allowing them to form cohesive parties and also using justice mechanisms to go after them. Um, and well, media is not that much under control of, uh, of local authorities, but still it is a relevant source of controlling information flows. Uh, but much more relevant are examples of electoral manipulation. And here you can find two instances. So one is called heavy rain. Uh, where heavy rain basically means an influx of cash before the elections as a way to buy patronage and buy electoral support. And the other is called katak or sort of political frog where people who get elected into office uh, because the office is elected on a personal basis, they then change their party allegiance uh, after the elections. Now, what moving on to the discussion, so what is this difference that we can find. And the difference that we can find is in the role of the central level of government. Um, the central level basically uh, is there to contain authoritarian tendencies within sort of local politics. And this functions more or less good in Bosnia-Herzegovina, less so in Malaysia, because here the central level is the one who actually propagates such illiberal politics uh, in the autonomous provinces of Sarawak and Sabah. Um, this power of local regional institutions is also different where uh, in Republika Srpska you have a lot of institutionalization where this boundary uh, is pretty much harsh and it can be controlled. In Malaysia, in Sarawak and Sabah, the boundary formally is pretty much strict. So there are a lot of um, individual uh, uh, policies that these uh, regions can take but it is heavily undermined by the central government 
uh, and basically there, there is nothing left that, that we can speak of as a boundary. And one sort of thing that mm -hmm. is relevant in both cases is this personalization of politics through patronage, whose effects are very much relevant. And this is something that I still need to look at in a bit more detail in both cases. Thank you very uh, much, Damir. Uh, really rich empirical uh, research on similar phenomena with the different facets in Malaysia and Bosnia. I would uh, ask our audience to post questions either on platform or via Twitter using Belsic uh, Forum 10 uh, hashtag. Um, and while we are waiting for you to get engaged, uh, I'll give a floor to Marco as a discussant uh, to challenge our uh, presenters today with uh, comments and questions for them. Uh, be ready to answer in a super short uh, responses, not longer than two mini minutes. Marco, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks for the presenters for the papers and the presentations today. So my comments, I would start by saying that I think the three papers taken together uh, in some of the different ways illustrate the, the, and the, the, uh, describe the deep-seated persistence of li liberal ruling par practices at the national level, in the, Nika, in the case of Nika's paper, at subnational meso level of governance, uh, in the in Damir's paper, and the sort of micro local level, uh, in uh, the paper uh, uh, presented by Chris, uh, but I think at least two of these papers uh, seem to be mischaracterized somewhat by the title of the of this panel, which of course happens all the time because you need to group different papers together. But the title of the panel says the, the state capture, uh, described state capture as a consequence of the international conflict resolution efforts. And I think two of these papers actually uh, show, uh, describe uh, how these uh, post-conflict institutions and interveners, they shape the form, particular form that the state capture takes in some places, uh, but they do not create them. The, the, the existing, the, the, the pre-existing uh, illiberal actors uh, 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 precede international intervention. So Chris, I think, shows how um, the sequencing of police reform can uh, empower one set of actors to monopolize local uh, security market or empower another set of actors or, uh, in some cases, force them to share this local market. Damir's paper uh, shows how power-sharing institutions expose certain levels and sectors of governments to partisan exploitation, uh, but actually they can also serve to protect, to isolate some other levels of governance for, for, from that kind of isolation. So the effect of the post-conflict institutions or interveners uh, are, are much more varied and there are interesting variations that these papers uh, tease out and they cannot be reduced to simply saying that the state capture is a consequences, consequence intended or unintended of the, of the uh, um, peace building uh, efforts. And I think it's worth highlighting uh, uh, the difference that we see here in this panel also bet between the three authors and the three papers because in Donika's paper, the focus is very much on the involvement of the in, 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 in external actors, in this case specifically the EU involvement in the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade. And, um, the argument is not, it's, it, the paper is in the early stages, so the argument is not quite clear in some parts, but the implication at least, uh, uh, the, the implication of the fact that Nick is focusing so much on the external, external actors is that, that this external actor is somehow crucial in enabling the liberal practices or the state capture, if you want, uh, to, to, to persist. So we see the two different assumptions, I think, in, the, in these papers, where uh, in two papers we think about the state capture as having independent domestic causes and then shaped and reshaped by the international intervention, uh, while uh, the, the, the Nikos paper, in my reading at least, she can correct me or introduce more nuance if she wants later, uh, the, 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 the state capture is caused or at, at least crucially enabled by the presence and actions of the international actors. I think it, the reason why it's important to you know, think carefully and tease out the, 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 the different mechanisms, different assumptions of these ex explanatory models, assumptions, is because uh, by storm, this notion of the stabilitocracy has become quite popular wo uh, word, buzzword in the community of Balkan academic or policy observers. And I think the notion, although it contains some truth, of course, hasn't really been under the, the kind of critical scrutiny 
that I would argue it, it, it deserves. So I would implore the panel here and the broader discussion that we have with the audience, virtual audience, uh, to think more critically and to have a dialogue about that notion of stabilitocracy and more broadly about the role that the external intervention has or does not have really in creating and sustaining illiberal uh, uh, practices of, of rule. So Donica in her paper uh, cites the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, uh, which is, you know, has done a lot to popularize this concept. And they define it sh shortly as externally driven support they sort of say that external driven support serves as the main source of legitimacy for liberal regimes. But I think Damir's and Chris's paper actually show how these liberal regimes at a different level of governance, um, although of course happy to receive the external legitimation when uh, that, that kind of legitimation is forthcoming, are instead much more rooted in the monopolization of violence, in the exploitation of public resources, patronage practices, as Damien mentioned in his presentation, and the legitimation strategies that are directed towards the local audience that are built on the legacies of the social and political legacies of the wars of the 1990s. So if, if democracy promotion by the foreigners and the uh, uh, peace building effort by the foreigners are not really playing more than a supporting role in uh, sustaining these liberal re regimes and re the practices of rule, uh, then it's also not really clear that it is within the power of the foreign actors to challenge and root out these regimes, or even though they may channel illiberal practices one way or another, as, as the papers show, they may not be able to eliminate this kind of deeply rooted, socially and politically rooted practices in the region. Uh, and I think the, the, the example that, the, the, that was mentioned in the presentation of um, foreign actors um, remove or, or playing a role in removing a reformist government illustrate this. Yes, perhaps they have a, or you know, we are not naive, so the foreign embassies do have an important political role in the politics of uh, weak and poor states like these countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, but removing those actors and bringing supposedly reformists in the power does not necessarily eliminate uh, these kind of liberal practices. So in the case of self-determination movement, the brief reform, it was a reformist movement, probably, probably maybe would have turned out to be a reformist government in a very narrow sense of dismantling patronage and corruption networks of the previous government, perhaps. But it's also an actor that is very illiberal uh, towards the uh, ethnic minorities, uh, uh, specifically Serbian, ethnic enclave in the north of Kosovo, at least was perceived as a very strong nationalist actor. So, you know, empowering such actors doesn't necessarily change the liberal nature of the regime, even though it may dismantle a bit of the existing state cor cor corrupt network. Uh, we see the similar thing, I think, in, in Montenegro ongoing right now, where the new government is, you know, born power by uh, uh, going after the uh, entrenched corruption of the past regime, but at the same time contains very radical right-wing uh, Serbian nationalist forces that, uh, for good reasons, a lot of the Montenegro minorities or more liberally minded citizens are, are sort of skeptical about. So even removing actors, if we allow that foreigners can remove actors, that doesn't mean that they can challenge these deeper Ill practices of illiberal, illiberal uh, rule. Uh, so my sort of provocation, my, my question to the panel would be to think, you know, more, for us to, together to think and talk about more, uh, in a more precise terms, whether uh, the state capture, or I think more, r rather we should be talking about the liberal patterns of rule, are caused, enabled, uh, shaped, reshaped uh, by the inter involvement of international actors, or are they actually mostly independent from uh, uh, the, the external involvement? Thank you, Marco, and uh, not to provide uh, amnesty for international actors, but if I may add a uh, complementary question to the one that Marco uh, asked, um, and this is if you were in the shoes of EU, EU or other international actors um, active in the region, what would you do differently so to avoid perpetuating state capture? Uh, shall we start with Donika, because there seems to be the most questions related to Kosovo, and then uh, we can move to uh, Chris and um, Damir. So, Donika, please. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, true. I agree with what has been discussed. Thanks, Marco, for, for the inputs. I mean, uh, the case of Kosovo is slightly more different because of the heavily uh, presence, heavy presence of international community. Uh, if you if you look at the Kosovo case, but also Bosnia in the Western Balkans, then, you know, the circumstances are slightly different. Uh, I, I will speak in, 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 about the case of Kosovo. I intentionally mentioned the role of EULEX in Kosovo and the executive powers of the mission uh, because I wanted to illustrate something. Having executive powers over literally everything, I mean, uh, which was the case with UNMIC, but then uh, the case of EULEX, especially in, 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 in cases which are extru of, of sensitive importance, uh, uh, such as the judicial. Uh, I mean, we are talking about the rule of law. We are talking about chapters 23 and 24. In the, in, in the enlargement process. We're not talking about uh, other issues of, uh, of uh, 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 less of an importance. Uh, this has created this uh, uh, environment first uh, for the blame game. I mentioned in the report uh, for, the, for the locals, it just provided another reason to uh, somehow blame the international community for the uh, state capture agenda within Kosovo. This de definitely does not provide amnesty uh, for the local stakeholders. And I, I definitely Definitely agree, Sonia. And and of course, uh, in the case of, of Kosovo, uh, what what uh, we should discuss is that uh, yes, I agree that uh, self determination of Rivendosi did not necessarily have the time to actually prove whether their uh, agenda was reformist or not. At least it looked like that on paper, and it was for the first time that actually Kosovo formed a government which did not include the stabilitocrats or the former KLA commanders, which have been part of the political system for so long and have been believed that by the international community that those who ac actually cause the problem are the only ones who can actually deliver on solving the issue, which proved to not be the case, of course. Uh, what, yes, uh, there is a, 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 a debate in Kosovo whether uh, we are just uh, changing one stability crack with another, and this is, of course, a major concern among uh, the elites in Kosovo, but but uh, there is a slight update. Uh, just before the elections have been engaged with the Serbian community here in Kosovo, there was a slight uh, change in approach towards Kurti. And, and this uh, also was proven by the fact that he had changed his approach towards many processes as he became uh, personally and his party became part of, of political processes in Kosovo. Uh, of course, then... Uh, Danica, I have to ask you to wrap up the response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, I will go back to the paper, it's in early stages, but definitely uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have refrained from uh, calling unintentional, but also intentional as well. So kind of is in, 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 uh, in between in the case of Kosovo. Because in the beginning, when, when, when this uh, chapter 35 from Kosovo in Serbia was introduced, but also in the case of this globalization association, agreement, there was a tendency to basically, by the EU, to somehow reform the countries, but also normalize the, the, uh, the relations. But then, in the, in the, in, throughout the process, they became part of this, uh, of this uh, narratives, uh, local narratives, which basically sort of uh, uh, made the EU part of this process. What would you do if you were, if you were international community? This is the question that we have often asked, is that you don't know what you would do because you are completely new, you are maneuvering in, an, in a new environment in which locals have captured the same. We have lost connection with Donika, so um, I'll ask uh, Chris uh, to provide if he has any comments on the empirical realities of the Balkans and the importance of external actors. Would you call them enablers or cause or just one of the um, factors in, in the local state capture? Chris, uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, certainly a thought-provoking comment, uh, Marco. Very, very interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'll answer it in sort of three parts. I think it's certainly true, this stabilitocracy critique in some sense, but also, you know, it has to be taken constrained to some degree. 
Um, if we think about things in a counterfactual sense, you know, if you took out the, the international actors, if you took out the geopolitical preferences, would you still have state capture? Well, most likely, I mean, you can look at developing, developing countries in South America and Africa, and you still have similar processes. Uh, so I certainly don't think that the international actors, international institutions especially, are sort of an independent variable in this sense that they're causing this, but rather sort of an intervening or a treatment. Um, there are different types of variables involved with you know, international intervention. Uh, I talk about it in my paper, the different types of interventions, but really it begins with the design of these uh, objectives or even beginning with peace settlements that they, they pushed for uh, in the 1990s, early 2000s, and then coupled with the strength of the intervention, diplomatic pressure, and how intervention is treating the different sides. Uh, so I think it's it's very, there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily determining the type of state capture, uh, but constraining the strategies for actors to secure resources or to monopolize control. And that's why we're seeing different outcomes in different places. Thank you, Chris. So a different view than what Donica presented. And Damir, you'll be the last speaker today. Uh, what's your take on this debate? Who is to blame? So uh, in three sentences or less, uh, basically also looking at Bosnia and Malaysia, we can see that international actors are not the deciding factor whether there is state capture, be it on a national or a local level. Uh, that said, international actors are not uh, fully out of the blame. What they do is basically through, uh, in the European context, stabilisatocracy, to give legitimacy uh, to actors that perpetuate state capture. Uh, the only aspect that can counter state capture is actually politics coming from below, uh, be it through social movements or protests. And here we see sort of a lack of engagement of international actors with such more local or bottom-up forces. Uh, basically giving legitimacy to the top, not supporting action from the bottom, that's not something that you want to do uh, in cases where you have state capture. Thanks a lot. I apologize to Artin Cholaku who asked the question and we didn't get to answer. We will try to provide response uh, on uh, social media, uh, I ask you to stretch your legs, uh, have a break and join us again in 15 minutes for the last panel of the academic event uh, and continue debate uh, using the BELSEC Forum 10 hashtag. Thank you for your attention and thanks to my speakers, Donika, Chris and Damir and Marco as a discussant. <laughs>